Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Consciousness Review. I'm Miriam Knight, and our guest today is Rasha. Rasha is the author of Oneness, the Teachings, and her new book, A Journey to Oneness, a Chronicle of Spiritual Emergence. Um, Rasha awakened to her inner calling in 1987 and began working with the divinity we all share in 1998. In the process, she was taken step by step through the life-altering changes that are shaking the foundations of today's world. Rasha is not affiliated with any established spiritual path, religion, or guru. Her teachings are universal and focus on the experience of the divinity within each of us. American by birth, Rasha now lives in South India. Rasha, welcome. I'm delighted you could join us. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you today. Rasha, all of your books and your website, they all focus on the word oneness. What does oneness mean to you? How did you experience it? Oh, oneness is a multifaceted presence that is the core essence of each of us. This is who we really are. And the opportunity is here to experience that, not just to believe it, but to know it. Um, oneness collectively is the all that is. And many people choose to refer to that as God. I consider oneness to be the all that is divinity. And um, extraordinarily enough, I've established a connection and am able to transcribe the teachings that come from that source and are now in these books that are written. How does it feel when you enter that state of oneness? Oh my gosh, it's, it is utter joy when I shift into what I call an, a higher octave of my own being. It's, it's like um, I'm cruising in a state of utter peace and serenity, um, there are no words for this. It's, it's quite remarkable. And this is a possibility that's not just reserved for me and one in a million. This is something that is possible for everybody, which is the exciting part of the message that's coming through me. Is this what is known as samadhi? Yes, it, it, it's referred to as that sometimes, although samadhi often... Um, refers to a state where one is in a state of mindlessness. It's, it's one of the octaves of meditation that is samadhi. Um, I suppose that this would be the, the end result of samadhi, but my experience of it is in a very conscious and waking state in the here and now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have spent... Um a good part of the last uh, 15 years in India. What do you find in India that draws you there and and how has that informed your understanding? Uh, India feels normal. (laughs) It's that um, I feel like I am able to be me there and I am a very spiritually focused person who does a lot of spiritual practice um, a lot of what they call sadhana. Um, in India, this is what people do. So I feel very comfortable there. I also live in a most extraordinary place, um, a town in South India called Tiruvannamali, which is one of the high energy places on the planet. So um, I think that's what drew me there is finding a place that felt vibrationally compatible with who I was becoming, where I could breathe easy and be in, in an environment of other spiritual people. Tiruvannamali is, um, was made famous by the great saint Ramana Maharshi, I'm sure you've heard of him, mm-hmm. who left his body in 1950. He has his ashram there and um, also famous because there is a mountain there, Arunachala, which is regarded by Hindus as the embodiment of Lord Shiva himself. 
not just the abode of Shiva, but the mountain actually is Shiva. So when I heard these stories, I, I thought at first, what a quaint legend, you know, that this, this mountain is actually God in form. But then you go there and you climb this mountain and you sit in silence. And oh my goodness, it, it is just an exalted ride of energy. So that's, that's very enjoyable for me and probably is the main reason why I've chosen this as my home base. You and know, it's, it's interesting. Well, there are a lot of kind of mountains and power spots around the world, like Mount Shasta or mm. in Sedona, there's that uh, place. Um, uh, uh, in in England, uh, there are places um, mm-hmm. where people feel a different kind of an energy. It's it's like it's a funnel into another dimension. Um, Absolutely. Do you think it could just be a high energy spot? I mean, uh, thinking of it as a, an enormous Shiva Lingam is, is a bit of a stretch of the imagination. Well, the, the mountain is considered to be a Shiva Lingam, as is Kailash and, and several other places like that. But it's more than just an energy spot. There, there are many places on the planet that are known as high vibrational places. But this place is different. This is also that aspect of divinity which is being exuded by this mountain. And you cannot help but feel that when you're imbibing it. When I go away is when I notice it. Mm-hmm. It's like something's missing. You become so acclimated to being in this um this kind of exalted environment. Not that it's all bliss, it's not. Because when you are in a higher energy place, it will bring your stuff up also. And people discover, you know, to their astonishment that this is this is not just a beautiful cruise. This is often a confrontation with your issues. It brings what is buried deep within you right to the surface. It's right in your face. Mm-hmm. So that you're encouraged to look at it and deal with it. Um, ultimately, it becomes a place where one can be at peace when, when one has actually dealt with all of these things. But initially, when people go there, they start to wonder, um, what's going on? I am crashing into a wall at every turn. And this would be true whether it's Sedona or Mount Shasta or Tiruvannamalai or some of the other places that are exalted vibrational environments. Mm-hmm. I've heard of up. that effect in Jerusalem where people kind of go, go a bit mad, actually. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. exactly this. And people feel like that. They're, they're totally out of whack when they're in a place like Tiruvannamalai because you know everything is energy. And if you're carrying density within you and you don't even know it, it's going to stir stir up the bottom of the lake so things get mucky. Mm -hmm. And um, that encourages you really to do the work, to focus on your spiritual self when you're in a place like that. Now, I've heard a lot of people refer to doing the work on yourself. What does that mean to you? Oh, wow. Well, the book Oneness spends 400 pages going in depth on that subject. It is really dredging the bottom of of what is there, the residual density that you may have carried forth from a different lifetime, or it may be issues that are what Oneness calls your life themes. This is These are the issues that happen over and over again different names and faces, but basically it's the same old stuff. Well, All is of it us really a question things. of if you recognize the truth, it will set you free? Is, is that enough? No, that is not enough. That's a good start. That's a mentalized process. We're not talking about the mind here. We're talking about energy and what it is within each of us, within our energy fields, that calls forth certain categories of experience. 
our life themes, what actually is happening to us, which are triggers calculated to allow us to feel the depth of our emotions, which actually is the key to all of it. So if you start to recognize these patterns of what's happening over and over again in your life, and you can trace that back to what emotion would a person normally feel when confronted with a situation like this. Is this an anger trigger? Is this a grief trigger? Is this a victim kind of a thing? What is it that I'm meant to be feeling that I'm blocking? You begin to ask yourself when these things come up. And slowly you are guided through methods in these books of how to deal with this and how to release this gently so this this stuff stops happening. Not that you're being encouraged to um, have a full-blown episode and give somebody a piece of your mind and rant and rave and vent. That's not the point. That would be actually fueling the fire. But there, there is a science to how to do this um, with wisdom that will dissipate the residual electromagnetic magnetic charges that are drawing repeat performances of stuff you'd really rather be done with into your life. So the book Oneness deals in depth with that, and the new book, A Journey to Oneness, is my story of how I dealt with some of this stuff, what I was presented with, and what I was dealing with in my own personal life. Because even though theoretically I knew all of it, that didn't spare me the experience myself of having to to live out my own issues and face some of the things that I thought I was handling so neatly that I had actually swept under the rug because it was too intense to deal with. Annoying, too much. isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, too much. Most of us have this because society has conditioned us not to express a lot of what is very deep and intense and painful. So we're polite about it and, you know, we deal with it in, in nice ways, thinking that it's okay, it's a tidy package tied up with a bow and it's done. Well, it's not done. And when we go to places that are power spots, it really unravels all of that repressed stuff. So we can deal with it. So we can release these energies. And so we have a chance of shifting into a higher octave of our own being, which is the gift we're being given in these times. So what do you think is actually that. happening in these power spots? Are you, are you kind of borrowing energy from the location? It's not that you're borrowing it. You, you are availing yourself of what is there. You're imbibing it. And so your vibration is ra- raising naturally. Um, when you're amping up your vibration, whatever is residual within you that is dense is going to be stimulated and want to be released. And that's not often fun. That can be really exasperating and um, painful, very painful. I remember years ago I heard a talk by Greg Braden, and he was talking about thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Mm Mm-hmm whereby thoughts um, give the um, general direction um, of where you want to go. The feelings give the quality, but the emotions are the motive force, the energy to bring that into manifestation. So emotions are incredibly powerful, and they're kind of the key, as you've been alluding. Yes, it is the key to everything, Hmm. your emotions. um and you need to have completed what what we were calling the work. This is the work of dealing with your stuff. And then you are in a position to embrace the exalted aspects of yourself that are waiting in the wings, ready to take you in this lifetime on a most extraordinary journey. That's what happened to me. And I was clueless. I had no idea what I was getting into. I was transcribing these profound teachings that I had no foundation in at all. What and had then, you been doing before that? Oh my gosh, I was living a very material life. Um, 
I had been a an advertising copywriter. I was on Madison Avenue. I then became a Nashville songwriter much later and ultimately started a very well-known New Age jewelry company, Earthstar, which had done very well before it kind of crashed and burned. But that's a whole other <laughs> chapter. And that's where the book, A Journey to Oneness, begins as I was watching it all disappear into the mist. Everything I had built was wiped out and not really understanding till later the significance of going through an experience like that. You know, so many people that I've spoken with who have developed um, kind of this transcendent connection with Source do so from the bottom of their their emotions, you know, a dark night mm-hmm. of the soul where you can't yes. go any further and you finally just say, okay, I give up, I surrender. Is that yes. what you did? Yes, I think for me the significance of it was to totally reorient myself in terms of my sense of identity, of who I thought of myself as being, I could no longer hang my hat on any of it. I had also um, very sadly gone through the loss of virtually every member of my family within a very short period of time before the uh, the bankruptcy happened and I lost my home and I lost the company. And it was, it was a tidal wave that washed through my life, but um, virtually everyone passed away in my life. Mm-hmm. So that all of the external frames of reference on which we hang our sense of who we are had been systematically eroded in my case. And so you start to ask yourself the big questions at that point. What on earth is going on and who am I really? And you stop seeking that sense of meaning and purpose in the world outside when you go through such a radical and profound um, experience of loss, you begin to turn the camera around and point it within. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Because there was nowhere else to turn. Nothing was connecting. Nothing was making sense. And at the same time, these extraordinary teachings were pouring forth from within me that were nudging me in a very different kind of a direction. Are you doing them through what? Uh, people call automatic writing? Um, I wouldn't call it that necessarily. Um, I think automatic writing is something that happens by hand. I was getting on the computer and essentially taking my consciousness out of the equation. I was sitting beside it, so I wasn't unconscious. I was watching this happen through my physical form. And then afterwards reading it to find out what had been written. So what happens to me is I, I'm what they call a semi-conscious channel, although um, the process of bringing forth teachings from one is, is not technically channeling. It's, it's a different process. Um, I have moment-to-moment awareness of what's happening, but it's more the sense of it going in one ear and out the other. Mm-hmm. I, I would have the sense of, oh, that's interesting as something is being written, but then I'll have no recall of it, and we'll have to read it for the first time later, as would anyone else. Um, I, I like to draw the distinction between channeling and being a messenger, because channeling is information that is coming from other than what you are, from outside of your own consciousness, whereas the process of merging with oneness this is something that is within. This is within me. I don't go out for it. I go in for it. And so um, it, it's a similar process, but um, it is very different. Essentially, Russia disappears. Russia dissolves into oneness when this happens now. But it has been a gradual process over the course of years to get me to the point that that is, in fact, what happens. Mm-hmm. It didn't start out like that. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. It was a, a very purposeful process that I was taught how to do this and how to do it safely and now, with wisdom. 
Although this is your story, um, you make the point in, in your book, in, in fact, in both your books, um, that it has a wider implication for the reader, that really this is the story of the emerging humanity. Is, is that a fair statement? That is the, the whole point of having come forth with a book like this, because um, when you read it, the introduction and the last chapter deal with my own reluctance to even write such a book. Um, I never intended to write any of this per- personal stuff. I thought that was just for me. Um, as I was transcribing the book Oneness, I was also dialoguing on a daily basis with Oneness about my own life and taking it down and filing it away. Never thought anything of it. 3,000 pages later, I was told, by the way, this is going to be the foundation of another book. And I balked. I said, no way. That's personal. That's my life. And (laughs) one said, yes, but you don't understand. This wasn't just for you. This was for the world. So um, we argued about that for a couple of years, (laughs) about whether I was going to actually share all of this. And I came to the point of surrender. And I thought, okay, let the chips fall where they may. People are going to think what they're going to think. This was my process. These were my doubts and fears and my exalted moments too. This was a journey. This is not to say that this is going to be your journey or anyone else's journey because one that says everybody's journey is different. It's as unique as a fingerprint. This is one textbook illustration of how a journey might go. And they say, I'm I'm the one who had the Murphy's Law version of the spiritual journey. I did every wrong turn. I fell in every pothole. I crawled down the spiritual path on my hands and knees much of the time in order to be able to show people who are having a rougher ride um, that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. That other people are having struggles and a difficult time of it. And that this, too, is part of the process. This um, embracing your own humility is part of the process. And that's why I felt guided to come forth with a very revealing book. And um, Well, you know, I was also impressed by, um, if you will, the... the uh, the step up to the global level, the um, the implications for the mass of humanity. And I, I went back to uh, oneness, the teachings, which I've had on my bookshelf for over 10 years. And um, when I opened it, I saw that I had dog-eared it and I had little, <laughs> little highlights all over the place. I'm sure everybody seems to be doing that. And yeah. I, and. I, I want to read one uh, uh, one passage that mm-hmm. I, I think will speak to to everyone. And you will be astounded by the extent of the shift in mass consciousness to come. People everywhere have begun the process of waking up to a heightened level of awareness. And even though most are still culturally conditioned to suppress such perceptions out of fear of being judged or ostracized, Energy is stirring within the depths of each of you, stimulating you to shed the habitual patterns that have imprisoned you. The feelings of unrest that have begun to stir throughout the collective consciousness will begin to play out and act as a catalyst for ousting any construct that serves to restrict personal freedom. And now listen to this bit, which is actually very very prophetic. Mm. Humanity as a whole has begun to question the basis for such repression, and the core issues on which those regimes are based will be found to lack relevance in terms of how the population at large perceives itself. Governments will rise and fall, economies will crumble, spiritual superstructures will wither, the power bases on which your world depends will find themselves depleted of resources and will be forced to release their grasp on the life force of the collective. And the doors will open to a new kind of thinking that will serve to empower rather than suppress the collective will of all people. I mean, talk about prophetic. 
Well, well, that is, in fact, what's happening, isn't it? Absolutely. This is before our very eyes, on the radio, on the TV, on the Internet. And you see that what is, in fact, falling apart is what's no longer ringing true to people. This is not a reflection of where we are anymore. And so the energy that was holding it in form is no longer able to hold it in form. Thus, it is dematerializing. And when you, you start to look at this collective world we think of as life from the standpoint of energy, you realize it can't be otherwise. Mm. The energy that is holding all of this in place has been withdrawn because it's not relevant anymore. People are in a different octave of who they are. And that is the vibration that people individually and collectively are projecting onto the screen of the ethers. That's what's being reflected back to us as the world. That's what we think of as the world. This is nothing more or less than a reflection. This is the energy we are all putting out there. So what do you think is happening? The energy that was supporting all of this old stuff isn't supporting it anymore. And we're seeing it fall apart, as it should. I, I think another element of this is that the notion of freedom is starting to take on a different reality in people's consciousness. Mm. It, because when they realize that when they make the connection between their thoughts, actions, and emotions, their, their, uh, their action in the world, and the consequences that they bring about, they are starting to get an appreciation both of their power and of their responsibility. They have the freedom of choice. Yes, um, I think that that is very well put. People have the freedom of choice. And the feeling that this has been denied us is repugnant to the people that are realizing who they are and the potential in humanness. Mm. It's not acceptable anymore. Um, whereas the empowerment to embody your truth and not have to live a paint-by-numbers life is what most people yearn for, to be authentic be true to themselves, and to be able to express that in life. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we all want. Whether or not we can um, call forth that possibility collectively is what is to be determined here. How many people can we get on the bandwagon to put out the good stuff vibrationally and let's, sh let's shift the wor world we're sharing? And that's the opportunity in these times. Because when we get it mentally that we're creating this, it gets rather interesting to see, okay, how would we like it to be? What would we like our world to be like? All options are possible, you know. This is not happening to us. We are creating this. And when we realize that we're empowered to really make a difference, we start to look very carefully at the vote that we are casting, each of us, onto the ethers with every breath we take. We want to put out the highest and the best and encourage everybody within earshot to do the same. Then we're going to have a world that's more a reflection of a higher quality variation on life that all of us, I think it, at some level, would really like. Um, I hope so. I really hope so. I thought it was interesting that in your book you say, um, or source says to you, um, do not look outside to gurus and psychics. Look within for yeah. your own truth. Yes. Yeah. And it is, by extension, uh, relevant to accepting what authority says as opposed to thinking for yourself and using your own internal litmus test as to what is right and what is not right. That's the essence of the training that's being offered in these books. 
this is not just one more jump on my bandwagon kind of uh, a message. This, these books are books of self-empowerment. This is, this, the source is within you. Learn how to tap into that knowingness. Learn to, to experience that wisdom for yourself without having to look for a nod of approval from some higher authority figure that's going to tell you which way to turn and what to say, what to do. Ultimately, that strength is within each of us. Mm. The books empower us to source it, to get comfortable with it, to know that we are limitless. Not, these are not just words to parrot. This is an experience to have and thus to know from your own experience of it. That was the journey I was taken on. And I was the least likely person to have gone on that journey. I was timid and shy. And, um, really, um, not at all a person who had trusted from my own experience much of anything. But I learned that what was within, you can bank on it. That is the rock on which you can you can rest everything when all else fails, mm -hmm. when in doubt, when when the cyclone is swirling around you and the world is going crazy. There is that rock of Gibraltar within that safe space. Then you can go there and know that it's right and feel that it is right, not mentally but with, within, within your, the core of your being. In your recent um, communications, um, have you gotten any sense of where humanity is going uh, at this time? <laughs> Are you optimistic? Um, I am always optimistic. You focus on what you want. I focus on the highest and the best. Where you place your attention is what you're calling forth from the ethers. So why would you focus on anything else? Um, all possibilities are there. We know this. It's, it's like all the shows on the radio station are all playing. Which one do you want to tune into and perceive as happening in your life? That's what's happening in our world. All possibilities have already happened. It's all there. Which one, vibrationally, do we want to summon forth and experience having happened? That's what's up for grabs. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'm optimistic. I f am focusing my full attention on how I want it to be. And I'm resisting the temptation to give energy to anything lesser, to, to be able to... Um, empower the highest and the best rather than um, repeating what I may see on the news and clucking over how, how terrible, how terrible. Well, yeah, it is. But is that how I, I want it to stay? No. No, I want it to be different. You know, it's interesting. It's so we, we all want to have a crystal ball and peer into the future and but the implication of that is that the future is already fixed. If the future is up for grabs. Indeed. There's infinite variations on the future hovering in the ether. All are possible. Which right. one are we going to co-create as having happened? That's where it gets interesting because this is a delicate balance between predetermination and free will and the free will of the collective, if you add the billions of bits of collective consciousness that are actually manifesting this, you see the potential to manifest anything, depending on what we're choosing. Mm -hmm. It's all there. Mm -hmm. It's all possible. Nothing is carved in stone. These are the words of oneness. It's all there. Oneness is here in form as each of us. Now, you have chosen to kind of dedicate your life to the search or the connection with oneness. Mm. What kinds of practices can uh, people within the framework of their current lives 
mm-hmm. undertake to make a better connection? Well, there's much to be said for what they call sadhana, which is spiritual practice. So um, I would encourage everyone to consider some meditation and prayer time in your daily life. Um, whatever shifts you into that space of sacredness. And oneness says that there is no right or wrong way to do this. This is a matter of what feels good to you. So definitely you can join a spiritual tradition and practice that if that feels good to you. Or you can go down a trail no one has ever walked before and mix and match um, different things that capture your imagination and um, tickle your heart. That's, that's what I did. Mm-hmm. I concocted my own recipe. Um, personally, I do a lot of mantra chanting. I've been studying with a master in India for over 20 years, and that does it for me. I'm not going to say that this is going to do it for other people. This is what worked for me. Um, talking out loud to God in the bathtub, highly recommend it. Using essential oils, driving down the highway with the windows rolled up, talking out loud to God, ranting and raving, highly recommended. Whatever it takes to get you into that space of authenticity, of prayer, and then you find that you are mouthing the words of your heart. You are speaking from your soul. You're reaching out in a way that is authentic because nobody's listening (laughs) and it's safe. (laughs) So I would say, yes, make a spiritual practice up. Create a holy altar, candles, incense, song, flowers, whatever gets you into that groove of holiness. And you will be amazed that what is really there is just waiting for you to knock on that door and reach out. There's a whole other world that's waiting (laughs) for us to tap into it. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to come and hit you over the head. You have to, you have to extend an invitation. (laughs) 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 You have to be, be willing (laughs) to have this be part of your life. You know, it's not like God is going to come and drag you down the street. It's it's not like that. Yeah. Well. (laughs) So the sky's the limit. It's interesting that Rasha, you and I met face to face for the first time at the International New Age Trade Show, where if you walk through the aisles, (laughs) you see absolutely every variety and form of tool, whether it's incense or chimes or colors or, or, uh, essential oils or whatever. I mean, just, just the whole panoply. But in the context of what you just said, all of these are tools for you to pick and choose from that will have meaning for you to get you into that space of your personal connection. Your personal connection. And there's there's no right or wrong way to do it. That's what's so refreshing, I think, about the teachings that came through in the oneness material is they're not tying the hands of anybody. They're saying go for it. Whatever feels good, that's right. Go for it. And this is a relationship more than anything. So you're going to want to spend time with it as you would with any relationship. If you want to really see a result from your spiritual journey, spend time with it. Make it important in your life. Make it a priority in your life. And you will be amazed at the difference that that will make because you'll see the reflection of that inner focus in your outer world, in the circumstances of what life is serving you up. Mm -hmm. If you are spending some time raising your vibration and touching into the sacred within you, that augmented variation on life is going to be reflected right back at you in the life that you are leading in the outer world. It's amazing how easy it is when you get the hang of it. So that's what I would recommend to people who are not doing it the way I did, and you know, meditating four or five hours a day and chanting and doing all the stuff that I did and go to India. Realistically, most people are probably not going to choose that. But 
you can have a sense of the sacred in your everyday life, even if you have a busy life. Um, and there's more to that than sitting in a minute in between meetings and driving to soccer practice and ballet lessons, which is a lot of people feel like their hands are tied with their busy schedules. Um, make it come first. Don't give it last priority. And you'll be glad you did. Mm. That, I think, is the message of oneness. So... Um how do people um, connect with you? I understand that you have um, a, a website and, and people can get your messages on a regular basis. Tell us about that. I do. There's a wonderful website. It's onenesswebsite.com. And there you will find an opportunity to sign up for all sorts of email series that will give you a, a moment of a profound quotation to ponder for a second and a gorgeous photograph to think about. And there's a, a second email series is actually a full minute of the very most powerful quotations from the book Oneness. Me, my voice, <laughs> speaking it, and you can close your eyes and have a one-minute meditation on that. That's something to sign up for separately. And it's all free, no catches, I'm not selling anything. Um, this is my gift to everybody. If you'd like to, to have a reminder of who you really are, please visit the website and sign up for one of these nice programs. Um, there's also a lovely CD, The Meditations of Oneness, that I co-created with Jim Oliver, a very wonderful and talented composer here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, we created seven different passages that are not in any of the books. These are recent writings that are calibrated to take you right into the heart. So you can choose one of them. I wouldn't suggest sitting through 78 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's too much. But um, choose one of them and it will put you into that beautiful space of heart. Then switch it off and go into your silent space. Try that. See what you get. Lovely. It's a very, very powerful tool. Um, and, of course, there's an audio book of the book Oneness that's available. An e-book is available. And the brand new A Journey to Oneness that just came out, I think it's been a full three weeks now. <laughs> it's been out. Um, it's very exciting. That is my own story of a spiritual journey and all of the divine teachings that I received all along the way that clearly were not just for me. How lovely. Well, we've been speaking with Rasha, author of A Journey to Oneness and Oneness Teachings. Her website is onenesswebsite.com. Rasha, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. 